Good afternoon and uh, welcome to another Focus on Facebook Live. My name is Hasneen Kermali. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at St. Mary's Hospital in Waterbury, Connecticut. Each month we bring you a new physician or clinical expertise here in the city of Waterbury through St. Mary's Hospital and Trinity Health of New England and to give you some insight on what we're able to offer to the community and our patients here in the, uh, in the city of Waterbury. Today, I'm really excited to, uh, to bring us Dr. Greg Kolodner, who is our medical director of our sleep center. Greg, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me here. Um, so sleep is one of the most valuable aspects of personal health and well-being, um, yet something that many people just do not get enough of. Uh, reported by the, CT, by the CDC that a third of U.S. adults get less than the recommended amount of sleep every day. Um, clearly, not getting enough sleep linked to many chronic diseases. Um, but the good news is that many of these sleep disorders can not only be diagnosed, but also treated. Fantastic. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Uh, so Dr. Claude, let's talk about sleep. That's what I do. That's what you do. Uh, but before we get there, let's talk about you as an individual, your journey, and what brought you ultimately to sleep medicine along the way. Um, well, I think that sleep is so ubiquitous, so common um, as a problem for, for everyone. Um, and everybody has an experience of good sleep and everybody has an experience of bad sleep. Mm and um, we know how important it is and we can talk a little bit about that as we get into it. Uh, I took a class in college in the uh, mid 80s, I hate to say, and um, uh, got excited about some of the science of sleep that I didn't know about, taught by a, by a psychologist actually. And then during my training as a pulmonary critical care physician, I was able to spend some time with uh, the sleep medicine team down in New York where I trained and was able to use that and get board certified and now I've been at St. Mary's for 19 years and we've been accredited as a full sleep center from the American Accredi Academy of Sleep Medicine since 2006 continuously. Beautiful. And um, so that's, what's, that's what I do. I do s still spend a little time in the pulmonary critical care side of things. Yep. But this is my main interest. You are our sleep doctor. Indeed. So let's talk about sleep. What is the simplest question? What is the recommended amount of sleep that a person should get? And the better question, I believe, is why that number? Well, it's a simple question. It's not the simplest of answers mm -hmm. because like many things in medicine, there's an average, and then there are people who fall on the lower and higher end. Sure. It's a little bit age dependent in that uh, if you look at adults over the age of 30 to 35, seven to seven and a half hours is probably the minimum for most people. Okay. If you look at young adults, that means uh, late teenage years to, to early 30s, it's closer to eight and a half to nine hours as wow. an average. Wow. Which, if you can imagine, getting to high school early is a, is a challenge in getting that much sleep. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as you get to younger and younger children, there's more sleep needed. Sure. Um, the function of sleep has been a, uh, almost a question of biology plus uh, uh, philosophy okay. over the years in that you know, we're, we're not really sure about all the function. We know that there are a lot of biological systems that improve with sleep, uh -huh. and we know that people can't survive without some form of sleep. Sure. We know that even people who are awake for 48 hours for unnecessary reasons have little micro sleeps in their brain. Their brain will actually go to sleep for two to three seconds and they won't even be aware of it. Sure. There are many physical processes that are improved with sleep, our muscle function, our immune system, our um, ability to have most hormonal treatments, like um, what I mean is like uh, our natural steroids 
in our body, our natural cortisol levels, our alertness, our body temperature, our, and we have also the function of dreaming, hmm. which is another whole different part of the process. Sure. In that we don't know um, completely why people dream, but we know that people who have interrupted dreaming have poor recall and poor memory, even if they get enough sleep. Hmm. So that's you know a completely separate uh, process, but part of our sleep put together. Dreaming, we know about dreaming and REM sleep since the 1950s. Huh. So so you you mentioned almost like there are different stages of sleep. Not like sleep is just this one basic thing that's happening. Clearly, the there's work that the body is doing. Even though the body seems like it's resting, it's not resting. There are phases of sleep, and can you describe that a little yeah. bit more? Yeah, so um, we as sleep uh, physicians like to talk about really three stages of consciousness. Okay. Where you're awake for 16 or so hours a day, and then we have sleep associated with dreaming, which is rapid eye movement, REM sleep, and okay. then there's the opposite, which is non rapid eye movement sleep. Um, there are stages of non-rapid eye movement sleep, but those are based on the size of the brain waves and a couple of different things that we will cat categorize when we're doing a full sleep study, but are all forms of non-dreaming sleep. Mm -hmm. And there's dreaming sleep. This is very interesting because a lot of patients now are using wearable devices mm -hmm. to uh, analyze their own sleep. And we encourage people to use wearables because the studies show that when you pay attention to your sleep, you actually get more of sleep. Mm, so right. it's a good thing. However, it makes it seem like that one part of sleep is better than another. That there's light sleep, there's deep sleep, there's REM sleep on most of these wearables. And when you look at it, deep sleep for most people is about a quarter. REM sleep for most people is about a quarter and light sleep is about a half when you use those definitions, but all the sleep is important. Mm, okay. So why we use those terms is more based on how easy it is for a patient to wake up rather than whether it's because of one kind of sleep is better than the other. I see, I see. So various stages of sleep, various functions during those stages of sleep, but what happens when you're not getting enough sleep? Well, you have physical problems and you have uh, concentration memory problems, you have mood problems. We all know what it is to wake up early, right? When we have to get up for something that we weren't expected to. You know, I like to say we get cranky. <laughs> I mean, that's the easiest way to sort of define it, right? And what happens when you're, when you're cranky? You're irritated, your mood is down, you... Um, tend to be a little more disinhibited. You might say something that you wouldn't otherwise. Uh, and that sort of, when we increase that, that can affect people who have, um, you know, different disorders in how they feel. And when we talk about um, not getting enough sleep, it can also affect our recall for complicated tasks like remembering to do an errand or remembering where somebody lives or something like that. You know, it's just something that's a little more complicated than, you know, what your kids' names are. Sure. Well, well what, about, what about things like our physical health? High blood pressure. Yeah, we know diabetes, that. Diabetes, cholesterol, things like that. Chronic diseases um, that we, we think about in men. We know that it definitely increases inflammation. It increases, um, decreases the pain threshold when you don't get enough sleep. It uh, affects our, um, as I said, intrinsic cortisol and body temperature uh, levels. It affects our uh, appetite regulation. Um, the the you know the original molecule orexin, which is now implicated in narcolepsy, was actually discovered because people were looking for why people get hungry hmm. or not hungry. Really, and it turned out that they found something completely different. So these are all related um, in, in physical health. So, so if I'm trying to get to sleep, sometimes it's hard for me to fall asleep. 
or some 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 people say I just can't get to sleep. What stops people from falling asleep? When we look at why people have trouble with sleep in general, we look at first whether there's something breaking up their sleep. Do they have a sleep disordered breathing problem where snoring can be a marker for sleep apnea? Do they have an environmental issue that's blocking them? Either their bedroom uh, conditions are not good. Do they have a physical problem such as uh, pain or uh, muscle problems? Do they have medications that may be affecting their sleep? And how is their behavior? What's, what's the pattern of their sleep? What's um, the exposure to light? What's their caffeine intake? What's their alcohol intake? But if, if all of those are generally looked at, then we really ask the question, is it a problem with getting to sleep at the beginning, staying asleep in the middle, waking up early at the end, or a combination, and how long the process is, has been going on, really. Mm. And when we look at those things, we can get a better understanding of the aspect of sleep. You know, we all want to control things more in our lives. We want to be healthier, we want to do the right thing, we want to read the right things, say the right things, eat the right things, but we can't will ourselves to go to sleep. Sleep's a passive process hmm. and you have to be able to withdraw from the wake world to get there. Hopefully okay. we're not withdrawing with medication. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, so if I wanted to see you because I've got a sleep issue or how how do I get around to, to, to getting myself to get to you or a sleep doctor in general what's the what's the pathway that I tend to take because I don't I'm not quite sure that sleep tends to be something that a lot of people talk to their doctor a lot about all the time yeah, well, it's definitely something now that most primary care doctors are aware of uh, sleep resources and what's out there and Great. some of the main main things. It's part of our Medicare annual wellness questionnaire when people come in for a series of questions. But Good. if you're not a Medicare patient, um, you still can go through your primary care physician. We come, uh, see patients from a lot of different parts of the medical system. Sometimes we'll see patients from cardiology who have a change in their cardiac status or arrhythmia that the uh, cardiologist is concerned the patient might have uh, a sleep-related condition. Sometimes we see ear, nose, and throat doctors tell us that they're concerned about this. Sometimes we see a gastroenterologist who's done a colonoscopy on a patient and said, hey, during when you were sedated, you really snored a lot. And mm. I was worried about your breathing. Right. We've seen them from psychiatrists who've told us, I'm having trouble with this patient who's trying to get their sleep better. Yeah. So there's a lot of resources, but it's really a referral to our sleep center from that from that doctor. Great, great. Actually, it's it's interesting because, you know, taking care of a patient just last week, we saw uh, was talking to his significant other at the bedside, um, and she was like, "Yep, he falls asleep and stops stops breathing." And I got to nudge him to to wake up, and he was looking over. He's like, "Really?" She's like, "Yeah, you don't even know." Um, and and it was that that simple connection to say, "Yeah, you need to go see Doctor Kalodner, and, and and let's let's get you in to see him." So it's nice to hear that you're that there's a lot of collaboration that's also going on between you and other physicians. It's not simply come to the sleep doctor, but there are other connections between providers and something we're seeing a lot here and I think in a lot of systems, but especially here at St. Mary's, that our physicians are starting, are continuing to connect between the two uh, and various specialties to connect their patients mm -hmm. together. Can you talk about that some more? Well, I mean, we've been, we've been working with those groups of physicians on many different collaborations. We're looking at, um, uh, even outside the system, there are dentists that make oral appliances that might treat sleep apnea. There mm -hmm. are exciting new surgical treatments for sleep apnea that um, are really 
becoming uh, important as an alternative for um, some of the traditional therapies for sleep apnea. Yeah. And also looking at our bariatrics program because some of our conditions are uh, weight related or weighted to, related to excessive weight and trying to coordinate with them. You know, when people have sleep apnea and undergo uh, ba successful bariatric surgery, over 75% of them no longer have sleep apnea. Wow. So that's a good um, treatment, plus all the other things that bariatric surgery helps. And also with our nutritional departments. You know, not everybody is a surgical candidate and using uh, medical techniques to help with weight loss is also sure. important. And I know we have the whole management. That's right. The weight loss manager, the, the weight clinics as well. Um, so you, you you started talking about sleep apnea. Let's walk down that road a little bit. Talk about sleep apnea as a condition that people have to work through and what are some of the treatments that are sort of the standards that, that people think about today. And, right. and then maybe let's talk about some of the new things that are out right. there. So sleep apnea, you know, maybe present in up to 10% of the population and maybe maybe more depending on what criteria you use to, to analyze it. But it's when our body doesn't get enough airflow during sleep because the muscle in the back of the throat relaxes too much. And we worry about sleep apnea because it does one of two things. It either, it either affects the person's sleep enough to make them very tired or some of the things we talked about, like being cranky during the day or affecting mood, memory, and concentration. But it also can put people at risk for many medical problems, such mm. as hypertension, accelerated hypertension, uh, heart attack, uh, thickening of the heart muscle, atrial fibrillation, um, and um, stroke as well. And long term, you know, these things get worse the longer that sleep apnea is untreated. Sure. It's a condition that's somewhat weight related, but not all weight related. So thin people can have sleep apnea. Um, and it's because this muscle relaxes too much. And what happens is you start snoring because the airway gets pushed together, just like a, a trumpet will make a noise when you blow air through it. That's sure. the same kind of thing for snoring. And if it closes enough, the brain doesn't, the lungs don't get enough oxygen. The brain detects a lower rate of oxygen, a lower level of oxygen, and the brain compensates by opening up the airway, but the only way to do that is to wake the person up. And so there's these repeated awakenings during the night which affects people during the daytime. Hmm. And each time you wake up, you have a little spike in heart rate and blood pressure, which leads to the long-term changes that I talked about. So sleep apnea is important for us to diagnose and treat and there are two types of sleep testing to see what is going on during the night for a patient. There is a home sleep test that we do for a lot of patients where the only concern is whether they have sleep apnea or not and they're generally healthy and they can follow instructions and they're an adult and this is a breathing monitor that you take home with you and gives us about six different values throughout the night. Okay. We look at it manually, we can count up how many breathing pauses you might have if you have it all, what your oxygen level is, what your heart rate is, whether it's related to the position you're sleeping in, and then we can get an idea of whether you have sleep apnea or not. That sometimes is enough testing. Other people, when they have more complicated sleep conditions or their children or they have other medical problems, we do a more extensive sleep recording and we have a nice new laboratory here in the third floor of the hospital. Right here at the hospital. Yep. Right? yep. People come in, it's their hospital rooms previously that have been repurposed for sleep. They're real beds, not hospital beds. Yep. People have their own bathroom and TV and it's quiet and there's a technologist there who monitors the person during sleep. So besides the breathing monitors, there are some brainwave monitors and leg and heart monitors. But we get a very large amount of data from that. Yeah. And we can tell whether you have sleep apnea, whether you have any neurologic condition that might affect sleep, what's going on with um, the pattern of your sleep in general. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we, we can diagnose other other things from that as as well. You know, people who have changes in their dreaming, for for instance. Um, so those are the two types of testing. And then we look at treatments. If we're looking at sleep apnea, we want to get that airway open. Gotcha. We want it to not close during the night. Sometimes it's enough. It's a nudge enough uh, looking at um, more aggressive therapy to open that airway. Mm. And so the uh, one of the options is the oral appliance like I talked about. That's a little more challenging in getting for all patients because of uh, just the way patients have uh, dental coverage and what kind of therapy it is. Um, and is that something they just put in their mouth and it keeps... Yeah, so what it is, sort of it, it sort of positions your lower jaw to move a little bit forward. Okay. So because your lower jaw is the only part of your skull that's flexible, it's attached to the muscle at the ba base of your tongue. And so if it's held a little bit forward, away from the back of your throat, mm. it can open up that airway a little bit. It's okay. best for mild patients, but most patients who have significant sleep apnea end up using what's called a CPAP machine, which mm. is a, a, a breathing machine that uses air pressure, regular air in your own home that's humidified through an internal system in the machine. The machine's about the size of a tissue box that fits yeah. on your on your um, night table and gives you, gives you air pressure by um, getting that pressure from the machine to your throat and stops the snoring immediately. And the technology has really advanced that people can track their own data. Um, the machines can be adjustable. And we help manage people with those. And they're generally well covered by insurance. Mm. Not everybody's a candidate for CPAP or okay. about a quarter of the people really can't do it. And then we look to surgical options if they really need um, therapy for sleep apnea, if it's going to be a long, long standing thing. Let's let's talk about the surgical options because I think CPAP. When we think about that, I remember in my training, it was about compliance or whether or not the patient can tolerate mm -hmm. both the appliance, but but even having the device over their face, yeah. the feeling of the pressure. Right. Um, having tried the device on myself, it is a feeling that you have to get used to, that, that feeling of the air going in mm -hmm. and keeping things open. Um, but if people cannot, there are options now that didn't necessarily used to be there before, or maybe they used to be there before, but now we have them available here in Waterbury. Well, it's both. Yeah. So, and people, I get questions all the time in my practice about this because there's a lot of marketing to consumer right. about um, surgical treatments for sleep apnea. And the most common one is the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, which the, the commercials people have probably seen are Inspire. Inspire, yes. And that's the product name. And it uses the same kind of technology that's in a pacemaker. Okay. But don't be scared. It's not a pacemaker. It has right. nothing to do with your heart. It's very superficial in your body. It's, it's an implantable device that gives an electrical signal to the nerve that goes to that muscle that's most responsible for collapsing the airway during sleep apnea. Okay. And the reason why the technology has just happened now is because the science is there with the timing of how to target that nerve and be able to be used during sleep and not during wake and how it's timed and how it's calibrated sure. and how it affects people. The device was actually approved in 2014 by the FDA. Okay. So surgeons and uh, sleep physicians have a good fund of knowledge yeah. on what works and what doesn't, and picking the right patients for something. Whenever yeah. you want put something in someone's body, you don't want it to be for the wrong reasons or for there to be complications. Sure. And so we we now have a a 10 year history of this device, and we're starting to do this at St. Mary's with our experienced ear, nose, and throat physicians yes. doing the surgery. Um, it's really for people who have moderate level of sleep apnea, meaning that it's significant, it can cause cardiac disease. They're going to be an ongoing CPAP patient, so you wouldn't put this in for somebody who's planning to lose 50 pounds in the next 
six months right. because you know we 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 want to see if what the reasons are. They we we wouldn't give this to someone who's been doing well with CPAP because that's working for them. Yeah, their BMI, which is we know is a, not a great level of of measuring weight, but is the best we have, is needs to be about 35 or less to be a good candidate. Okay. And that's because of which muscles uh, close the upper airway. And this is for adults, full, fully grown yeah. patients. We're not gonna use that in children. Sure. Um, we don't wanna give it to someone who surgery is a high risk. Um, we don't wanna give it to someone who has a lot of cardiac and pulmonary problems that we're worried about, or whether they have a different kind of sleep apnea, which is called central sleep apnea. Um, which is a, um, a sleep apnea based on the brain synchronizing with the airway okay. rather than the airway closing. But what happens is a sleep doctor and or an ear, nose, and throat physician decide that the patient's a good candidate. So the ear, nose, and throat physician goes over the, the, the process with the patient. Okay. And we want to make sure that they have a, a recent sleep study that shows that they have sleep apnea. For most of those people, that can be just another home sleep test. Okay. Usually you have to have a sleep test within the last two years to mm -hmm. show that. Then the um, ear, nose, and throat physician does a examination of the upper airway under anesthesia to really see what is going on during sleep so that they can make sure that the person's an excellent candidate for the, the surgery. And that's called a drug-induced sleep endoscopy, D-I-S-E, or DICE. And that's basically like an, another endoscopy procedure, except you don't have to do any prep. <laughs> and um, they, they monitor your airway while you're asleep. Okay. After that, the surgery takes place soon after. Yep. Um, it's a same-day surgery. They're, the recovery is minimal, like you would have for any superficial skin surgery. People can go back to work, you know, essentially the next day. The next day. Um, and then the, the device has to heal a little bit, so we, we don't turn it on right away. Yep. It's, it's monitored in the operating room, but we don't turn it on right away. It takes about four weeks to start, and then you come to my office, and we start the calibration process, Okay. which is turning it on, figuring out what the specific really minute settings are, and sure. you start using it at home. And after that, you don't need to use your CPAP or other therapy anymore. Wow. We usually do a follow-up full sleep study so that we can fine-tune the calibration during the night. Sure. We actually can change the, the device during the night. The patient's experience at home is that they basically have a remote control that's the size of a cell phone that they put on their you know, next to their chest when they're ready to uh, initiate it, and they put it back when they when they get up in the morning. They it's basically like an on-off switch. Right. And um, it's very compatible now. The ones are compatible with MRI treatments. The battery is very long-lasting. It lasts uh, 11 years, is what they say. Okay. And when it's changed, it would be changed through local a local incision. Yep. And that's about the size of it. That's amazing. I mean, it, it truly is an advancement when we think about where we've gone 10 years ago to where we are today. Um, it's, uh, it's listening to the patient. Uh, I can't use this device, doctor. I can't sleep with this thing over my face. I just can't do it. And this is an option for those patients. And we hear them a lot. We hear them in the hospital. I'm sure you hear them in your office. Um, and clearly sleep is one of those things that people crave. I know, I know I love my sleep. Um, and I'm sure everybody does as well when we can get it. So this is for them. It's listening to them and, and it gives them that power that they don't have something on their face. And, um, clearly there's a process for the right patient. It's an option. And I'm glad that we're going to be able to, to offer this for, for our patients here in the Waterbury community as well. Yeah. I mean, that's what we, we have to do as sleep doctors. We listen to your whole 24-hour experience, yeah. and we have to meet you where you are. You know, we the last thing we want to do is judge somebody for what therapy they can or cannot do, and it's really trying to f fit the individual patient to the treatment that they need.
It's wonderful. I love it. I love it because it's focused on the patient, which is what our goal here is always. Um, before we go, one last thing, like we always do, a nugget for the people watching um, from you to them. So the nugget that I have is the best therapy for improving your sleep better than any sleeping medication or any other behavioral therapy is getting outdoor light in the morning. Keeping your internal body clock, your circadian rhythm, adjusted very well by using morning light can really improve things. And we're getting to that time of year where there's going to be more and more of that available. So thanks. So up in the morning and outside to enjoy the daylight. Thank you very much, Dr. Claudner. Really Thank appreciate you. everybody watching, and we will see you next time.